All right, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. I am super excited that we're back in a, an original space here, not the original space for this hospital, but one we used for many years in the past. Um, I will say part of the move back here is we believe this is now a, a safe and secured space through COVID. So we will have this space going forward. We lost it during the vaccination period, as you all know. I don't think that's going to happen again. The other reason was we really, really, really want to increase attendance. Um, it is critical for our sense of community and our sense of learning that we're here together doing this. And so we are moving back to this space, even though it was not the easiest thing to do, because I would like to see this place filled up with hundreds of people every week. Uh, we'll continue that message for the weeks going forward because it's just that important. As a little bit of a teaser to get folks excited about the next couple of weeks coming up, on October 4th, I really am very excited. We're welcoming uh, Tyson Bell from the University of Virginia. Uh, he is an infectious disease and critical care expert and an expert in communication, especially during uh, difficult times like the COVID pandemic. And so if you haven't met Tayson or seen him on NPR or New York Times or any of those other places, you should come to that talk. And then on October 11th, we're going to hear from Tracy Bale. Uh, she is the Anschutz Foundation Endowed Chair in Women's Integrated Mental and Physical Health Research at the Ludeman Center. Uh, she's in our Department of Psychiatry talking about stress dysregulation, early childhood changes, and the impact on adults. It's actually pretty profound work that she is doing. Uh, so I'd really encourage you to attend that as well. CME MOC credit is available for all of our talks this year. We're happy to continue to do that. Make sure we can move forward here. Yeah. Just want to make, you didn't break it. There we go. I just want to make sure it works for you. Uh, and we'll take most of our questions from the live audience. I really am, am pleased to welcome up today's speaker, Dr. Josh Barocas. Dr. Barocas is an associate professor of medicine here at the University of Colorado in the Division of Infectious Diseases. And he is also the senior visiting fellow with the National Drug and Alcohol Research Center at the University of New South Wales. He's the medical director of the JL Transition Health Program at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And he's the current chair of the Human Rights Committee for the IDSA um, and an ID clinician who does all of his clinical time at Denver Health. He was an undergrad at Wash U where he graduated cum laude. He did his medical school at George Washington University where he was AOA. He was an intern, resident, and chief resident at the University of Wisconsin, and then did a fellowship in infectious diseases at the Brigham and Women Mass General Program. He also received some advanced training in clinical effectiveness while he was at MGH. Dr. Barocas's work uh, focuses on underserved and marginalized communities. It really began very early on in his career. Um, during his undergrad years, he was a civil rights fellow at the Leadership Conference for Civil Rights, the Leadership Conference for Educational Fund, all through the Harvard Civil Rights Project. In medical school, he was named a Tauber Scholar for his early work on human rights. He was a recipient of the Charles A. King Trust Research Award, as well as the prestigious AAMC Herbert W. Nickens Faculty Fellowship Award. He now leads an interdisciplinary research program with the goal of improving health outcomes for patients with infectious diseases, substance use disorders, and other vulnerable populations. His research uses clinical epidemiology, health economics, situational modeling, and cost effectiveness to inform clinical decision making and health policy. It really is an honor to welcome Dr. Josh Barocas. Okay, does this work? All right, this is my, I call these the Madonna mics. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm going to try not to do my usual, which is uh, wander around uh, like Madonna or Taylor Swift. Um, so if I start to, I apologize. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, public health and public health policies and doing things that we try to inform those policies, at least in a positive way. Or... Oh, no. All right. What did I do, Jeff? Did I screw it up? Or... All right, we're going to do, I got it. Perfect. Um, I put this, I, this is up a few times, so don't feel like you have to snap a shot right this second. Um, my disclosures are that uh, the vast majority of my funding comes from uh, the NIDA uh, at the NIH, as well as some state funds. I put my acknowledgments, there's a few slides, bear with me. I put my acknowledgments up front so that you all know that this is not what I do. This is what this is a team effort, um, specifically uh, the bottom part of this, which is my home lab uh, and, and a bunch of my collaborators. I think that it's important that we acknowledge those people that help us sort of stand up uh, up front. 
And I also try to make sure that we're all centered on where we are. Um, we are right now on uh, Arapaho and Cheyenne tribal nation land. I'd like to acknowledge that and know that uh, we have a lot of work to do to repair some of our, our relationships. So learning objectives today. Um, because this is CME and because this is uh, MOC credit, to gain an understanding of the heterogeneity of the overdose crisis in the US. So I already just gave away the theme of the talk. Uh, two is identify principles of public health research that can influence policy decisions and to gain an understanding or a deeper understanding of the relationship between homelessness, substance use disorders, uh, and, and sort of what we can do about it. So um, I have to say that when I suggested uh, the, the theme of this talk, I, I felt like my daughter Eleanor in taking uh, too big of a bite. And it's very possible that some of you in the audience might be feeling the same, like why is this guy gonna talk to me about all of public health? And that is not my intention. But uh, it does raise some questions, right? Are we asking the right questions? Are we, uh, how do we find our place in essentially a world that is laden with public health problems? Um, that is now really blending with social issues, social determinants of health. And I'm just gonna editorialize that I think it can feel like we're losing. And it can feel like this, right? If we're the bird, um, some of this is about antagonism that we feel with perhaps policymakers or um, with our larger community. And uh, if we health professionals, public health professionals, or scientists in general, we feel like those jaws are going to clamp down on us uh, at any moment. And it's really easy to put blame on the, the other side or the other part of science, which is the, the recipient. Um, and it's not all in our heads. And this was Dr. Hotez and I did not collaborate on this. Uh, him putting this in the LA Times, um, that uh, scientists have been sitting, have become sitting ducks. And, um, and I, I'll argue uh, in a moment that some of this, while we feel like it's all them, that we're stuck in the jaws, that in fact, some of it is actually our own inertia. Um, you know, we have, um, we have been taking the same, generally the same um, public health approach epidemiologic approaches for the last hundred years or so, and it's hard to change. So that inertia is on us. And really, we tend to ask about three questions when we're talking about public health and epidemiology, surveillance, et cetera. What's the scope of the problem? What's causing it? What are we doing about it? And sometimes when we have time and resources, we ask the question, how's it working? But I'm gonna posit that there is more that we can contribute to that, that landscape of, uh, or that global slide, the, the, all the public health problems that we see. And I think that we're, we're losing, or we feel like we're losing, one, because of that antagonism, it's real. Two, because of lack of resources but also three because of inertia. And please don't throw rotten apples at me, but lack of creativity and innovation. So for every, because for every question that we're asking, there's a hidden one, I think, underneath. One place that I think that we're, that we think that we're losing, we haven't quite lost yet, is with the overdose epidemic specifically in the US. I'm gonna use this as a case study and we'll go through this, but as we go through it, I want you to think about your own work, be it QI, clinical, research, education, or administration. This is really sort of a little bit of a journey and a tale about what we find when we look underneath and what, happen, what can happen afterwards. Now, I wanna be clear, I'm not painting a rosy picture. 
uh, about the overdose epidemic. That's why um, we're talking about it today. But I think to continue, especially in this space where we were, were uh, having problems with burnout and with, um, with all sorts of, of other issues within our professions, it's important to recognize that our work can have an effect. So let's start with the, the scope of the problem. No secret um, that we're in the midst of the worst overdose crisis in history. More than a million deaths attributable to opioids since 1999, about 107,000 in 2021, and more than 108,000 in 2022. And that's not even done counting. And it hasn't affected the, the US, as you all know, uh, the same. This is heterogeneous. We look at this map on top. Our opioid overdose death mortality per 100,000 from 99 to 2001 on the bottom is from 2014 to 2016, with white areas being low mortality rates and black and darker areas being extremely high or very high rates. And even within those data, there's heterogeneity. So what started in 1999 or thereabouts as a prescription opioid epidemic. This has grown, it grew into a heroin epidemic and now a synthetic opioid epidemic like fentanyl. Along the way, each one of these inflection points occurred with supply side regulations without dealing with the underlying problem. And the and geographic patterns have emerged over the last 10 years as well. These are three different groups, three different maps. The first column are any opioids and overdose deaths per 100,000 county population. The second map is, or the second column is synthetic opioids and the third column are psychostimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine. And while we're not gonna go into each individual uh, county here, what you can see is over time, there were different uh, geographic regions that were affected more either earlier or more strongly. And one of the biggest risk factors for uh, overdose is opioid use disorder. Prevalence of opioid use disorder by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, which is done by SAMHSA every year, has remained relatively constant over time. So according to NISDA, as, as we in the, the biz call it, um, our prevalence of, of opioid use disorder has remained more or less steady from 2015 with a jump in 2020 and 2021 from about 0.9% to 2%. So just for a moment, staggering numbers in and of themselves, 2% of the population is 6 million people, right about, which is about the size of Colorado or the population of Colorado. But these numbers, I think, don't tell us exactly um, what the scope of the problem is. And it makes us, and it should make us question the size of, of the, the population. So the question that I ask is, what are we missing? So we count people in epidemiology, especially for opioid use disorder and diabetes and colon cancer, we count people. Um, we do it usually with, in two ways. One, we do door-to-door -door surveys or, or handheld surveys, uh, like is the case with uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, or we use administrative claims data, like our own hospital data. Of course, there are problems, right? So NISDA, uh, excludes large swaths of the population. It is um, a household survey, so it excludes people who are incarcerated, experiencing homelessness, or even hospitalized. Um, and of course, nobody really wants to, to talk about their, their substance use with a random stranger. So there's social de desirability bias. Administrative claims require a diagnosis. So it means that I, as the physician, have to actually code it correctly. And it's only, we only find people who are receiving healthcare services. So we can already see a problem 
the question is, what do we do about it and why is this important? And you can see here, is it because the, the overdoses, as I've shown on other slides, are increasing or is the size of the population at risk larger than we think? We need this for resource allocation, service planning, decreasing disparities. And the line that I love to use um, is we can't reach people that we don't know uh, exist. So enter deer. Deer uh, are uh, th this method that we're gonna talk about. I'm not gonna go too far into the, the methodology, but we are in Colorado. And as Dr. Connors mentioned, I spent time in Wisconsin where deer are very important to our way of life. And so this little method that we talk about um, has everything to do with deer because it was developed by fish and wildlife. Um, it's called inappropriately, in my opinion, capture recapture, but we'll move on from that for a moment. Um, and I love talking about this. So what happens? Again, keeping this high level, you grab 60 deer in a population, you tag them and you let them go. A short while later, you capture 30 more deer or 30 deer in general, and you count how many have been tagged. And just using sort of basic laws of probability, what you can, with a lot of assumptions, what you can look at is say, I tagged 60 deer to begin with, and that is some proportion of our general population of deer. In the second capture, I grabbed 30 deer, 15 of them were tagged. So sort of the laws of, of probability would suggest that our total is 120 deer. This is a very um, straightforward schematic of a very complex issue. Of course, people are not deer. We uh, move about a lot more differently um, and we're much more complex. But what we can do is try to replicate some of these methods when we have large data sets that have been linked together because each time somebody is found in one of those administrative data sets or a survey, and if we know that that person is the same person across data sets, then each time they're found um, in a data set is a different capture. And so what we can do is develop a contingency table just to look at who's been found in what data set, and then do fancy multivariable statistical models estimating confidence intervals. And we had this opportunity in Massachusetts to do this because as you can see, the public health data warehouse individually links at the individual level, nearly 20 different state agencies. And the wonderful thing about this, this data set and I'll say Massachusetts is that they do have universal healthcare. So the spine of this was the all payer claims data set. So anybody who has touched the healthcare system ever is in the all payer claims data set. What we found was striking and this gets at the what's underneath, what are we missing? Here's the percent of the opioid use disorder population that was known and unknown over a five year period. The gray bottom, is the known proportion, the people that we can count. And the blue on top is the unknown. So we estimated more than 50% of the population with OUD in Massachusetts had not received any diagnosis, was not known to the system. It means that they weren't being counted. So what does this mean for the overall population? So the known population, the people that we were able to count was 119,000. The unknown that we estimated was 155, bringing us to a total of 275,000 people. Now, this slide, I know that there's skepticism in methodology always. Our prevalence estimate was 4.6%. 4.6% of the Massachusetts population in 2015, we estimated with an opioid use disorder, whereas NISDA was estimating about 1%. If you take both of the, our unknown and known together, you get a, a prevalence that's about four or five fold higher. For the skeptics, even if you totally, totally don't think that our methodology is sound whatsoever, um, if we take just the known population, 
the people that we were able to count using all these linked data sets, the prevalence was still two and a half times higher than it was using NISDA. So we know that that NISA is our sort of not even close to the, the, the basement of where we are. So what happened next? I promised that we were gonna talk about policy and how, how work has effect. So at that point, this was the first time that anybody had done this using for opioid use disorder, and it showed the value of this very large complex linked data set. Um, at the time, the governor, uh, Charlie Baker, increased after this report hit his desk, increased funding fourfold for substance use disorder within the month. The data set is now passed by the legislation in perpetuity um, because of the power of, uh, of what this public-private partnership can do. We have now replicated the analyses in Kentucky, Ohio, and we're working, one of uh, our, our lab is working on opioid use disorder and the prevalence of youth homelessness uh, here in Colorado and, and specifically in Denver. Um, we're working with the opioid councils who are very interested. Everybody wants data. And this is across the board, not just with opioids, not just with overdose, but everybody wants data to help inform decision-making. And, and we have as scientists, this rare opportunity to help use our expertise sort of for, for population health good. Um, so next question that we usually ask, what's causing it? We're gonna look at a subset of people uh, who are at risk, at high risk for overdose, and that's people who've been incarcerated. Uh, some of the formative work in this was done by Ingrid Binswanger, um, who many of you know, and there was a landmark study that she put out way back in 2007 when I was just a child um, and that looked at about 30,000 people who were released from Washington State Prison. She compared that, their mortality to the general population mortality. In the first two weeks after release, the risk of death of people who had been incarcerated was nearly 13 times that uh, of other state residents, and the relative risk of death uh, from drug overdose was 120 times, 29 times. Since that time, we have identified, we being the larger community, not me, um, have identified risk factors for overdose among um, previously incarcerated people. You can see this sort of comprehensive list, and this has all been done through surveys and administrative data. The usual suspects are all there, right? Age, sex, race, number of incarceration related factors. And yet this follow-up study in, that was published in 2022 in the American Journal of Public Health showed that in North Carolina, totally different region, um, the opioid overdose risk uh, or death risk for formerly incarcerated individuals from synthetic opioids compared to the general population in the first two weeks was 50 times. At one year was 20 times. So nothing much has changed. So the question that I ask and the question that I'm really interested in here is, is there a different perspective that we might be missing? Enter community engaged research and community engagement because context matters. It turns out that in all of those surveys, in all of those administrative data, those were, those were surveys that were developed by people like me and nobody actually asked the people who were experiencing uh, the incarceration. Community engaged research, I know that Don Neese gave grand rounds a few weeks ago, but just uh, for those that, that need a refresher from a non-expert, um, researchers, community members come together, we combine our knowledge together so that everyone's involved. And what I love about community engaged research is that it gives a voice to underserved communities. So um, one of our... Uh, research assistants, as well as one of the um, new faculty here in GIM, Caitlin Masters, have been working on what's called a concept mapping uh, project, where the goal is um, 
to create visual representations of, um, of the relationships of the issues at hand. And what we wanted to do and what they wanted to do was identify factors that people with prior experience within the criminal legal system perceive as, a, as influencing substance use and overdose following incarceration. I showed you that big table a moment ago. We wanted to see if there were, just test the hypothesis. Was there something different? Could we be missing something from the lens of the community? So very briefly, because again, I'm not an expert in in uh, community-engaged research, but I've learned a lot through this process. We, you initially recruit people um, through a sort of snowball sampling method. Um, we held introductory sessions and conducted three focus groups with this group of, of individuals with a very basic question. What do you think are some of the main things that make people who have been in prison or jail more or less likely to overdose? I cannot tell you how long it took to come up with that sentence. So you brainstorm, and this is where participants list out factors that they believe answered the prompt. In session two, where there's this sorting and rating uh, process that goes on, this is where you take your brainstormed ideas, your brainstorm factors, and you sort them into piles, essentially like socks and underwear. You can think of it in that way. Um, that makes sense for them. And they also rated the factors based on two rating questions. Finally, the last meeting was about community interpretation, where the participants chose the concept, where they chose the concept map um, that they felt was most representative of their beliefs and their perceptions. So I started this talk saying that I wanted you to think about your own work. This sort of methodology has been applied in everything from education to QI to how do you resolve conflicts within teams? And so we just applied it in a different setting. Super cool. 83 factors were identified many of which were not identified in the literature review. Now, generalizability, obviously a problem anytime you're doing um, small focus groups. That said, I think what it gets at is it, it helps us understand that our, our old fashioned ways of doing things may not be totally sufficient. And what it does is it shows people what it, it helped our participants see where there were connections, which you can see big themes that came out had to do with being turned down for treatment, having trauma-informed providers, um, ensuring basic needs that are met, especially after release, like housing, food security, childcare. And a big portion of this was shame and stigma. What this concept mapping exercise shows, and without going into the details of each number on there, is for example, that stigma and structural barriers are one of the biggest sort of compartments of what people are saying either influence or don't influence their risk of overdose following incarceration. And that somehow it might be tied to resources for treatment uh, of substance use. So again, how has this changed policy? What is happening now? I think that apart from anything that's happened with new state laws, with how voices of people with lived experience are being incorporated into public debate and public discussion, um, the most important thing that has come from this is community empowerment and lasting relationships. This sort of this sort of empowerment and bringing people together is what I think is, has caused some of the change that's happening at the state legislature. So what are we doing right is the next question. And I, I, I sort of smirk when I go through all of these because the ones that, the things that come up in my mind are obviously um, the most recent COVID pandemic and, and other ways that we've been dealing with public health issues. Syringe service programs, syringe exchanges, as many of you know, um, 
The first needle and syringe program uh, in the US was opened in the late 1980s. I'm a, I like history, so we're gonna go through this. Um, in Boston and um, in Tacoma, Washington. Then there were programs right after that in San Francisco. We have 40 years of data that suggests that SSPs decrease bad outcomes. Everything from overdose to HIV to hepatitis C. And using that data in 2009, then President Obama signed a bill authorizing the use of federal dollars for needle and syringe programs. But as of 2022, and, sorry, and as of 2022, at most states had at least one SSP. Some of the states here in um, sort of light blue in the Midwest and Southeast don't, and in some places they remain illegal. In 2011, Florida was one of those places that had no SSPs and where they were illegal. The question that I like to ask is, if something's working well, can we do more of that? So um, a, a dear colleague of mine in 2012, then medical student, Hansel Tooks, published a study in drug and alcohol dependence. They asked a very simple question to help inform whether Florida should be having, should incorporate or change the law on needle and syringe programs. They walked through neighborhoods in both Florida and Miami. They picked a random sample of the top quartile of drug affected neighborhoods in both of those places. As I said, San Francisco had syringe programs, Miami did not. They counted syringes. It was literally that simple. And I, I like to joke uh, with Dr. Tooks because um, it's, it's not actually, it, it wasn't this sort of brilliant idea. It was just a simple question. How many more syringes are there? So you can see they calculated both syringe prevalence and syringe density. Miami versus San Francisco. The number of publicly discarded needles on the streets of Miami was eight times higher than in San Francisco. This is obviously adjusted for population because as you know, this is a, a prevalence and, and density. Um, in density, there were 44, uh, in San Francisco, 44 per 1,000 census blocks and in Miami, 371. The syringe prevalence in, in San Francisco was 0.3 per 1,000 people and 4.9 per 1,000 people. They also conducted, aside from this, quantitative surveys of people who inject drugs in the two cities. Syringe disposal locations were significantly higher in the Miami group when it came to just throwing them in trash, but more importantly, public places. And this was one of the biggest, biggest um, uh, pushes in their work because we oftentimes think about, and our policymakers oftentimes think about drug use as a public safety issue. We're worried about our own kids, we're worried about our own community, and what, what this team was able to show was that when there weren't, when there wasn't a proper place to dispose of them, people were more likely to discard them in public places. So medical student, this was like the biggest eye opener for me. It's made me be very open to medical student work. Um, in 2012, um, Hansel began to work to change the law. He support, there was a supporting resolution for a statewide needle exchange law that was adopted by the Florida Medical Association. Bills were introduced in uh, 2013 sort of piling on top in 2015, they published a manuscript demonstrating how much um, taxpayers were paying for uh, the treatment of injection related infections in, um, in Miami. And in 2016, as a direct result of, of these data, um, the Infectious Disease Elimination Act was passed. I'm just gonna, without being political, um, Florida is not necessarily um, 
a, a progressive state when it comes to this sort of thing. And so the fact that this was pushed through in the, in the uh, course of essentially seven years is quite amazing. Um, it is now standard uh, practice in Miami to have teleharm reduction that's been implemented uh, at both the idea, uh, they named it the idea exchange, and they now distribute more than 4,000 syringes to people in Miami per year. So the lesson for me here is that um, not just could we be doing more, but who has, how can we come together to do more of that? Whatever it happens to be, how can we utilize the resources of, our, of the university and the community to take good ideas and make them more broad? So the next question is, in the, the final question that I, I think we oftentimes ask, is what do we think we're doing right? So involuntary uh, displacement here in, in Denver, um, we know that one of the biggest issues that uh, voters have faced, that our policymakers are facing has to do with um, homelessness and helping, hopefully helping people experiencing homelessness, not just dealing with the homelessness problem, but one of the ways that, um, that our policymakers across the country have, um, have attempted to, um, to publicly deal with some of the, the issues around homelessness was with involuntary displacement. This is called sweeps, this is called clearings, cleanups, whatever, ha what, what have you. And it's usually cited as a public health or a public safety issue. The intersection of homelessness and substance use disorders is not necessarily completely overlapping, but we all know that there is a Venn diagram with a large amount of overlap with substance use, specifically opioid use, um, cocaine and methamphetamine, as well as homelessness. There are small cohort studies, but some from our own city in Denver, San Francisco, and Los Angeles that show that um, displacement, involuntary displacement, affects medications for opioid use disorder, syringe sharing, and overdose directly. And as I said, the Venn diagram is is quite stark with 50% of people experiencing homelessness having had or have a current substance use disorder. So we've now touted, we touted is the wrong word, we use involuntary displacement. We talk about sweeps all the time. If you open up the Denver Post, that was the front page um, article, I think yesterday or the day before about the, the encampment that was in front of um, Ethan Lincoln. As we go through and making sure that we're not just following with inertia, question that we, I think, have a responsibility to ask, so are the practices that are happening around us harmful? So I'm a super nerd and I like simulation models. For those of you that, um, that ever played like SimCity as a kid, or um, I don't know what if there was anything before that, but I'm gonna use SimCity. Um, this is the nerdier version of, uh, of SimCity, where what we do is we create a simulation of what we think is the real world just to examine the hypotheticals and the long-term consequences or benefits or costs of our actions now. Because one of the things that we say in decision science is that a decision has to be made. So we can either make the decision in the absence of any data, or we can make the decision in the presence of some data. So what we did is we developed this simulation model that, um, as you can see, has is a very oversimplification of the life of somebody who may inject drugs and is experiencing homelessness. We gathered data from 23 cities using the uh, National HIV Behavioral Surveillance uh, Project, which includes data from Denver. We populate that 
23 times, 23 different ways. We create 23 different populations based on age, sex, and injection practices among people who are experiencing homelessness. We give everyone based on either primary data or um, published data, a risk of endocarditis, skin and soft tissue infections, um, overdose, non-fatal and fatal. We give them a risk of being hospitalized, dying in the hospital, of being connected to care outside of the hospital, being retained in care. And we give everyone a probability of changing their behavior, their injection behaviors. And of course, all of this influences a person's mortality and a whole bunch of other clinical outcomes. We use clinical real world data to inform this sort of virtual laboratory. And we asked again, a very simple question. In a world where there's no displacement, where people are left alone, um, where the encampment stays at 8th and Lincoln, um, where access to MOUD therefore is not affected, overdose probability is not affected and syringe sharing is not affected, to continual displacement or the risk of being displaced. This does not mean that everybody gets displaced every single week, and it doesn't mean that everybody gets displaced ever. It just means that you have the risk of it. Where they're forced to relocate, and we know based on cohort studies that it does change MOUD, overdose, and syringe sharing practices. What this slide is meant to demonstrate is that across the board, among thousands of simulations, um, a shout out to the team that runs the model with me and for, for our group, because this is, not a, this is an onerous task where it's thousands and thousands of simulations on each of those cities. There was no single outcome, including overdose deaths, Display um, serious injection related infections, um, non fatal overdose, each type of infection, as well as life years lived over a 10 year period in which outcomes were either neutral or positive. So that neutral part is the one that I sort of like to hang my hat on because what it shows is that even if we vary our assumptions so widely that I make the computer system sort of start smoking. There's nothing, there's no situation in which this is good, that this improves health outcomes. And in fact, one of the things that we looked at was, um, was that displacement increased the population attributable fraction of death. And I'm just going to if I know how to use anything, right here is Denver, um, because we are adjacent to Denver this moment. Population attributable fraction means that you take 100 minus 100 times the death in the base case over the deaths in the counterfactual. And what we show is that there could be as high as 25% more deaths if you continue to expose people to involuntary displacement. Um, than if you didn't displace them at all. Now, some of the things that we've talked about in over the course of, of having this, this study out there is um, we understand that, that unsheltered homelessness is not without its risks. What we did is we held all of that constant. And we said that nothing else was changing except for your sort of your access to care. So again, what's happened, we showed that uh, there was no feasible scenario in which displacement was beneficial or neutral to health outcomes. Um, the Denver's mayor, the new Denver's mayor has um, at least softened or sort of reversed course. Um, multiple cities uh, and multiple stakeholders in um, mayoral offices, city councils, um, have cited this as part of their um, rationale for uh, changing some of the practices, including Minneapolis, Seattle, and Vancouver, and even Miami. 
Um, we have had engagement across the board, including with the CDC and with the um, with HUD. And one of the really wonderful things about this type of, I think, work um, is that uh, CDC cannot, as many of you know, make decisions without any without data. And while I understand that this is modeling data, it still helps provide a base for them um, to consider new policies. So I go back to this slide. I posited at the beginning, and somehow I stayed on timing, um, that we're losing antagonism, inertia, and lack of resources. But I also think that there is a question that we're all capable of asking underneath each one of those. So what are we missing in understanding the scope of the problem and who are we missing? What's causing the problem? And instead of sticking with our, with our ingrained notions of what's causing the problem, we have to ask, could there be a different perspective? If we're doing something right and we know that we're doing something right, then we have to, and we have a responsibility to help other people see that this is a good thing and that we can do more of it. And we have to be able to ask that very difficult question, what do we think we're doing? What do we think we're doing right? And could it actually be harmful? So, this relationship that we talk about that I started with between scientists, researchers, public health professionals, and policymakers can be symbiotic. I, I may, many of you may already know the sort of anecdote of this little picture, but this is a, actually a symbiotic relationship in nature. The crocodile does not, I think that's a crocodile, um, does not actually eat the bird. Um, the bird cleans the teeth of the crocodile while it gets a, a meal. And so this is actually a symbiotic relationship. And if we start to see that we aren't necessarily antagonists and that we have something to offer uh, to our policymakers and to some and to our local decision makers, it helps them um, be willing to pivot. It helps them, change the status quo, and it helps them to continue to invest in programs that work and not in programs that don't work. So I leave you with this, whether you are QI, whether you are education, administration, research, or clinical, our work can have an impact, and we just have to ask that question below. That's all I got. Thank you very much. Yes, that was uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. We'll start with questions from our audience. Um, and while we're waiting for a few hands to go up, I just wanted to ask you, you talked uh, a little bit about Massachusetts, Florida. What about the local landscape in Colorado for things like syringe exchange? Um, do we have unique challenges here? Do we face sort of just common problems that you see across the nation? Can people hear? Do I need to repeat? Uh, they should be able to hear. Okay. Um, so here in Colorado, um, we, uh, we are unique and we are also not unique, right? So um, some of the issues that we are grappling with right now, specifically when it comes to uh, the overdose epidemic have to do with um, the newly, or I guess more newly changed drug supply. So whereas in Massachusetts and other parts of the, of the Northeast, um, fentanyl, for example, hit the Northeast in uh, as early as 2013 and really overtook the landscape in 2013 through 2015, we haven't had that until 2018. So many of the policies that we're considering here um, are, are, I don't wanna say that they're behind, but because we now have an, a new landscape here. The other thing that I think is unique about Colorado and, um, and is our, is our frontier mentality. Um, we have 64 counties here in Colorado. Each one believes, um, this is not a valued statement, just so everyone knows, believes that there should be only local control of what happens in their own county. 
as opposed to places like Massachusetts, which only has 14 counties and nobody can even name them. Um, or places like Kentucky, where there are 120 counties or 123 counties, but all of them see themselves in sort of a, uh, an ecosystem. So we do have some unique challenges here, which is why I think that having local um, uh, for, the, for the residents and medical students and early stage folks, um, not everything has to be generalizable. Things can be local. And that's how some of our policies and some of our policymakers um, make decisions based on what's happening in their own community. Josh, uh, thanks for a lovely talk. And I wanna commend you on taking really, I think basic epi methods and applying them to real world clinical problems. Very elegant, informative, uh, and really nicely done with a range of individuals from students all the way to faculty, so, so kudos. Um, my question to you is about, um, the lag, the lag from data to policy to practice to change. You know, the famous BMJ paper looked at clinical interventions, the 17 years comes up as a clinical trial to changing practice. And I'm not even gonna ask what that lag is in, in public policy, because I assume it's a pretty large confidence interval. My question to you is, what are the things you've seen that shorten that lag? You went very quickly from your modeling paper in homelessness to changing the views here locally. How do you how do we scale that? What what works in terms of getting the data to the right people to making change happen? Um, I appreciate the the question and the comment. Um, and I will also point out um, I did wear a tie for Dr. Chopra today. Um, <laughs> um, I own one. Um, so uh, the question around the question around how to sort of shorten that lag is a very interesting one. Um, we are in academics um, rewarded for high impact papers, for um, generalizable findings, and for things that reach broad audiences. Um, we can't necessarily change all of that culture. That's, I understand that that is baked in, but there can be a yes and. With each paper, um, there can be a one page, one paragraph issue brief. It can be a quick conversation with some staffer at one of our representatives offices. And I know that that sounds trite, but policymakers um, are incredibly busy and trying to get high level findings into their brains all the time. I'm lucky, all I have to think about when I'm on service is how to treat endocarditis. When a policymaker has everything from overdoses to housing to Tabor on the, the docket, what we need to be able to do is, is translate our findings in digestible ways. The other thing is um, I, for a long time in, um, in academics, um, advocacy has been um, a four letter word. And I think that there is a difference between being an advocate for data and evidence-based approaches and being an activist. Um, and I think that we as scientists, as public health and as medical professionals have a unique opportunity to advocate for evidence-based practices and use our sort of collective voice and to some degree, the bully pulpit um, to advocate for, for things that we know based on data uh, are work or don't work. Um, that's, uh, I'm very bad at answering questions on the spot, but I think that that's, um, that's my, my quickie. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. You, you kind of touched on what I was going to, um, ask as well, as far as, as far as being, um, an advocate. And I actually think not only do we have an opportunity, but we have an obligation um, to use our, use our work to advocate for problems in communities that need help because these people can't help themselves, clearly. What 
what would you tell the learners in the room as far as even developing their research questions and starting to engage in the community? That's key. What other things would you advise to get the policy makers locked in early so that as they're um, designing the study, it could have a more significant uh, impact? Um, I love that question and I will try to take it brief. Um, my easy answer for the learners in the room is, yes, for, the, for everyone in the, the room, but especially for people who are um, trying to figure out their own path in the scientific process um, and are trying to do public health type work, is to read the newspaper. Um, and uh, it has, it's not to stay informed, but it is, it shows what is on everyone's mind all the time. Right now, if I say homelessness in Colorado, I, I'm going to assume that everyone has a picture. And it's partly because it is always in front of us. And some of the best questions come from very simple observations, whether it's bench or bedside or out in the world, um, simple observations, what we see with our patients every single day um, is the same thing that we can do as we're driving down Colfax. Um, the second part of the question, oh no, now I forgot it. What was the second part? I had it. How to engage with policy. Oh, engage, thank you. Um, that I think is an entire lecture or talk or discussion on its own because it's complex. And I think that relationships take time, um, whether it's with policymakers, people with lived experience or patients, right? That all of this takes time. Um, but I look at it first and foremost as this is not an antagonistic relationship. Um, I am here to, in whatever capacity that I can with a policymaker to educate and to develop a relationship. After that, trust is built over time. Um, and so as opposed to going in and saying, I have the right answer, I know what to do, here's, here's what you're doing wrong. Oftentimes, there's, it's, it's simply a lack of, of knowledge. And I think that we have a responsibility to, as people who are scientists and public health professionals, to be able to translate those our, our evidence into digestible um, digestible forms. Time for one more question. I'm going to walk back to Dr. Campbell. While I do, I wanted to, uh, uh, if you couldn't see who asked the last question, it's our newest division head, Dr. Jennifer Christie. So welcome to Colorado. Josh, uh, I was really struck by the um, figure that you showed us that 50% of uh, people experiencing homelessness also have opioid use disorder. And you showed us how policies uh, for uh, homelessness can affect opioid use disorder. My question is, what's driving what? How much of opioid use disorder drives homelessness and vice versa? And how can we have better you know, policies to sort of break whatever that cycle is? Um, so that is actually a million literally a million dollar question because I think it would be like an R01. Um, it, it is not necessarily, it is a homogenous, it's not a homogenous answer. There are some people who fall into um, the cycle or the Venn diagram first because of substance use. There are some people who um, fall into the cycle first because of housing instability and, um, and homelessness. I think that a, a one-size-fits-all approach clearly doesn't work. And B, this is where connection with community can help. Because what we saw, for example, in the point in time survey that just came out um, a few months ago, was that there was an increase, for example, of, in 60, and point in time survey for everyone that doesn't know, is how we count people experiencing homelessness across the US. It's a it is a very flawed methodology. I will put that out there as a statement, um, but 60% uh, increase in families. Um, families experiencing homelessness experience it much differently than someone um, who's an individual. And so instead of taking 
blanket approaches like encampment sweeps. This is where community connection, um, working with stakeholders at on the ground um, can actually inform better policies and also better research questions. That's great. We are right at one o'clock. So Dr. Brokus, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs>